Sometime before his departure to heaven in 2012, Dr. Brian Bailey made a statement that I meditate upon often in these days. He stated that God would soon allow the United States to experience major changes. He saw that the nation would spiritually, as well as in other ways, go down, down, and down. We are certainly experiencing this at our present time. Dr. Bailey said that the end result of the changes and difficulties in the United States would be preparation for the revival which would ultimately spread worldwide to the nations of the earth. The church, especially in our nation, has greatly declined in recent times. We desperately need a mighty move of the Spirit of God in this country. It is a time that we need to give ourselves to prayer and waiting on God for a fresh and sovereign move of the Holy Spirit in our homes and in the church. This is reflected in the heart cry of the prophet Isaiah in chapter 26, verses 9 through 10. My soul yearns for you in the night. My spirit within me earnestly seeks you. For when your judgments are in the earth, the inhabitants of the world will learn righteousness. If favor is shown to the wicked, he does not learn righteousness. In the land of uprightness, he deals corruptly and does not see the majesty of the Lord. Those who respond to the Lord as he brings judgments upon the earth will learn righteousness. They will embrace what God has desired for them and will accept God's ways to become part of their lives. However, even though it seems favor is shown to the wicked, they will not turn to learn God's righteous ways. The wicked will continue in his unjust ways and will not experience the goodness of the Lord. We want to be those who respond to the Lord with our whole heart, allowing God to deal with us to change any lack in our lives that would hinder us from moving on in God's purposes. We cannot change those who do not love righteousness, but we can purpose in our hearts to draw near to the Father and learn His ways. Even at this present time, the nations of the earth are beginning to feel unrest. Recently, my wife had to be in the hospital for a few days. She stated to me that she felt such distress in her spirit because of the atmosphere of all the people around her in the hospital. So many people have the spirit of fear upon them because of the conditions in the earth and because they do not know the Prince of Peace. The Apostle Paul tells us in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. This is a mind that is disciplined in self-control to keep focused on the Lord and what he is saying to us regardless of circumstances or what we see going on in the world around us. Part of this is learning to filter and close our minds to those things that inspire anxiety and unease. This could mean not feeding upon ungodly reports or choosing not to dwell on and engage in conversations that focus on anxiety or discouragement. 
We want our eyes to be fixed upon the Lord Jesus Christ. In the days ahead, God's peace is going to be a necessity, for it is his peace that guards our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. We receive this peace through remaining in right standing with God and disciplining our minds to remain focused on Him and what He is saying. In addition to freeing us from ungodly fear, He also wants to anoint His people with the spirit of the fear of the Lord. There is a promise given in Psalm 33, verse 18 and 19. Behold, the eye of the Lord is upon them that fear him, upon them that hope in his mercy, to deliver their soul from death and to keep them alive in famine. What a wonderful thought that God has his eye upon his people upon those who love him and obey him. What assurance and comfort that can give us. God's purpose is to deliver the righteous who love him and seek his ways. He wants to deliver them from death and from the shortages that will increase on the earth. The Lord says that these precious truths are for those who fear him and hope in his mercy. We do not need to fear what the people of this world fear when we are walking in obedience to the Lord. For our hope is in the everlasting God and in his mercy. The Lord has provision for his people. Even during the times of great difficulty, the Lord is always faithful to those who love and obey him. He will care for each of us who walk in righteousness, and he will provide the natural necessities of life to sustain us. We see the miraculous provision of the Lord in the life of the prophet Elijah. God had called for a famine in Israel, but he gave Elijah specific instructions of how he would provide for him during this time of shortage in the nation. In 1 Kings 17 verses 3 and 4, God said to Elijah, Depart from here and turn eastward and hide yourself by the brook Cherith, which is east of the Jordan. You shall drink from the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. He was sustained for a length of time by this means that God provided for him. We must learn to obey the voice of the Lord, as did Elijah. In our personal lives, we must learn to hear from heaven and obey so that we do not miss out when the Lord is giving us directions that will keep us. This is important, especially for pastors, because we are responsible for teaching our sheep so our congregations can be kept in the days ahead. Later on, that provision was removed from Elijah and the brook dried up. God then directed him to go to a specific widow who was preparing the last meal for her and her child. God told Elijah to ask this widow for water and bread. In chapter 17 and verse 15 and 16, and she went and did according to the saying of Elijah, and she and he and her house did eat many days, and the barrel of meal wasted not, neither did the cruise of oil fail, according to the word of the Lord which he spoke by Elijah. 
God's word is letting us know that the Lord can care for us through any lack that may occur in our day. If we are walking in obedience to the Lord's voice, as did Elijah and the widow, God will take care of us. We need not fear. Following the miraculous provision of God, the widow's son fell ill and died. Elijah took him and cried out three times for the Lord to restore his life. The Lord was gracious and the son was revived back to life. Time and time again, we see the Lord's intervention on Elijah's behalf. If God was faithful to them, we can be assured that God will show himself faithful to meet with us in our time of need. Whether we have need of food or whether we have a physical problem, God has the power to supply what is necessary for us to maintain our walk with him so that we are able to fulfill his will during our journey on this earth. However, we must not look to the world as our source of provision, but we also must not allow the fear of this world and the events taking place to sway us or turn us away from keeping our eyes on the Lord. We must trust in the Lord that he will provide for us as he did for the man of God, Elijah, and as he has for the saints throughout the ages. Many people in the world live in fear of what is happening in the earth or what may happen to them. Personally, in the days ahead, that is what my wife was sensing when she was in the hospital. But God wants his people to look to him and be full of the fear of the Lord and to hope in his mercy. We do know that there are conditions in our own heart that we must meet in order to qualify to be partakers for the Lord's intervention. Two in particular I want to consider are the areas of finance and the wisdom of godly fear. The first of these areas of qualification is how we handle our finances. Finance is always a very critical factor in people's lives spiritually and physically. Jesus considers carefully how we handle the blessings he has given to us and how we respond to times of lack in our lives. Right handling of finances especially in regards to tithing and offerings, is a prerequisite to receiving the blessings of the Lord. If we will obey the voice of the Lord speaking to us, God will give us wisdom for financial stewardship. This will enable us to manage our money well, not only to meet our own needs, but to be a blessing to others. As we have said, tithing is a critical matter for God's people. God has commanded us to give a tithe or a tenth of our income to the Lord's work. Many of God's people have become very lax in their obedience to tithing. In Malachi chapter 3, verse 8 through 10, we see the importance that God has placed upon the tithe. Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, in what way have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse. For you have robbed me, even this whole nation. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. And try me in this, says the Lord of hosts, 
if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such a blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. When the nation of Israel stopped giving a tenth of their income to the Lord, God accounted that to them as stealing from him. However, God declares that they would be blessed abundantly if they would obey him in the matter of their tithe. God wants to prove himself to each and every one of us, and even to our children. He desires to show us how he can give us an abundance in return for our obedience to him. When our children were growing up, we taught each of them the importance of giving to the Lord. We demonstrated to them by our own actions what it means to tithe. In receiving this instruction, they grew up to be generous givers and obedient to the Lord. It is so important that the parents instruct their children in the ways of God so that they too may walk in righteousness and receive God's blessing. My wife and I have purposed in our hearts to always listen to the Lord's voice when he speaks to us. This includes our finances as well as other matters. We encourage you to be sensitive to God's word and be obedient to his voice. At a seminar that I was giving in another country on the topic of finance, the interpreter who was a pastor came to me. He told me that it was customary for him to use his tithes for his own expenses, such as gasoline for his car. God dealt with him and he set his life in order. He began to pay his tithe and offerings into the church and not for his own use. Because of the obedience of this man, his church began to flourish. How a person handles their finances will tell us a lot about their character. Many people, if they have money in their pocket, feel that they need to spend it upon their desires. God wants us to learn to listen to the Holy Spirit and not be frivolous in how we spend our money. We are told in Proverbs 13, 11, Wealth gotten by vanity shall be diminished, but he that gathers by labor shall increase. So many people are very vain in their handling of money and feel secure when they have a lot of it on hand. The result is that they end up spending it foolishly as a display to other people. However, God says that vanity of seeking for wealth will lead us to being diminished instead of being blessed. There is no true security in this world's wealth. Righteousness is much more valuable than all the riches of this earth. God places tremendous value upon the righteous, and his eye is always upon them. We are told in Psalm 37, verse 25, I have been young and now am old, yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. A righteous man will conduct his life such that God will see to it he has plenty. If we will do what is right in God's eyes, God says that he will not forsake us and will provide that which we have need of. This, of course, does not mean that we do not need to work. Proverbs 10 verse 4 says, he who has slack hand becomes poor, 
but the hand of the diligent makes rich. God expects each of us to work hard. He wants every one of us to learn to be diligent in our labor and management of what he has provided for us. Working hard with diligence enables us to invest in the lives of other people. Our giving can be a testimony to them that in turn can launch them into helping invest in others as well. Many times, God increases our ability to give in order to be able to help others that are in need. We are not to store up wealth for ourselves. All of us have times of change in our lives. The days in which we are living seem to change from day to day. God wants us to have his peace that will carry us joyfully through all of these times of transition. We can fully trust the Lord because he has our good in mind. God's desire is that his people live with contentment in their heart. He is not interested in us seeking to fulfill all kinds of desires that are not born out of his purposes. This is why we must earnestly guard our hearts. In Hebrews 13, 5, keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. God wants our trust to be in him, not in the things of this earth. We want to come to the realization that God loves us and he wants the very best for each one of us. As we follow God's directives in handling finance, God will lead us to holy contentment. The Apostle Paul gives us a long list of ungodly and discontented people in 2 Timothy chapter 3. He speaks of their various wicked characteristics that we will see becoming more evident in the days ahead. One of these characteristics is the love of money, which we know is the root of all evil. God wants to spare his people from being cursed by these things. He does not want his people to be filled with these characteristics, but rather to be contented and fulfilled in him. We must not become caught up in the spirit of the world and allow wealth to guide our lives. We want the Holy Spirit to guide our life so that we can have that which is eternal and draws us closer to the Lord. In Proverbs 10, 22, the blessing of the Lord, it makes rich, and he adds no sorrow with it. The second area of qualification is having the fear of the Lord in our lives. This is the beginning of wisdom and makes right choices before God. Having the anointing of the spirit of the fear of the Lord is critical for the days ahead. It is a stabilizer that will help us through the turbulent times that will exist as the Lord fulfills the end time purposes for the church. The fear of the Lord is an awe and respect for his position, his power, and his character, and of what he has planned for the coming days. It is also a hatred of doing anything that would displease him. Proverbs 9 verse 10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. This godly wisdom is a result of the fear of the Lord.
It is God's divine ability to do what is right and keep his commandments. It is diametrically opposed to worldly wisdom. Earthly wisdom is the spirit of this world expressed through man's tendency to make choices resulting from self-seeking and self-promotion, envying, strife, and bitterness. The church has neglected the wisdom that contains the fear of the Lord. It has become very irreverent in that which the Lord deems as holy. The church as a whole has compromised and lost the sense of holiness in the things of God. The result is that people take lightly how they behave and do not have honor that is due to the Lord. The revival that God has planned must have a holy awe about it. The spirit of the fear of the Lord will be a primary feature of this next move of God. This anointing will fall upon individual communities, cities, and nations in the last great revival. Isaiah 33, 14 states, The sinners in Zion are afraid. Fearfulness has surprised the hypocrites. Who among us shall dwell with that devouring fire? Who among us shall dwell with everlasting burnings? This verse is speaking to the church of God, to those inside who have not been walking according to God's word. Dr. Bailey, in his commentary on the book of Isaiah, says concerning this verse, When God moves in revival, those in the congregations of the Lord who are not walking uprightly come under great conviction of sin, and they tremble before his holiness. This is essential for revival to produce what God wants to come forth in the church. We need to see the restoration of this holy fear. God wants to move in a new way with a depth of holiness that is worked out in our lives by the fear of the Lord. God will cause this reverent fear to come in a strong way to convict his people so that they have a deep awe of God and a holy reverence for his name and his ways. In Isaiah chapter 33, verses 5 through 6, The Lord is exalted, for he dwells on high. He has filled Zion with judgment and righteousness, and wisdom and knowledge shall be the stability of your times, and strength of salvation. The fear of the Lord is his treasure. The Lord is declaring here what is necessary to stabilize and to get us through the judgments to come. If we are pressing on toward Zion, God will train us in judging matters properly and have developed sensitivity to what is right in situations. God fills Zion with judgment and righteousness because he must purge the church from their iniquities and ready the people of God for the events that are coming in the days ahead. The church must understand godly judgment to set things in order so that they are upright before heaven. The wisdom and knowledge that God gives creates a stability in our own personal lives and in the community of God's people. Without these, the church would not be able to stand. In James chapter 3, the apostle speaks of the value of heavenly wisdom 
and warns against the pitfall of worldly wisdom. Worldly wisdom depends on our own intellect and ideas and is self-promoting and selfishly motivated. The fruit of it is that we will be filled with bitterness, envy, strife in our hearts. It is earthly, sensual, and devilish, according to James 3.15. But in contrast, God's wisdom has a completely different nature. This wisdom is given to those who fear the Lord and who desire to obey and please Him in all that they do. Those with this wisdom wait to hear from God before moving so that their lives may produce the wonderful fruit and character of Christ's wisdom. So this wisdom is developed in those who are wholly dependent upon the Lord and whose lives are surrendered to God in true meekness. We know the fruit of this wisdom is from above because it is pure, peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy, according to James 3.17. The fruit of the wisdom of this world will not sustain us, but rather it would destroy us. The wisdom from above is what will be a stability in our times. God's wisdom and knowledge will be the pillars of our stability. And to those who value and esteem his ways, he will give his treasure, the fear of the Lord, that will keep us in the right pathway. In Proverbs 19.23, the fear of the Lord tends to life. And he that has it shall abide satisfied. He shall not be visited with evil. What a beautiful promise to those of us who embrace the fear of the Lord in our lives. God will take good care of us. The Lord has invested a lot into his people. He desires and will have a glorious church without spot or wrinkle. His church is to be like a glorious bride fit for the Lord Jesus Christ. Even when the judgments are upon the wicked, the glory of God will be a protection for his people. And although there are some difficult times ahead, God has wonderful things planned for those who love Him and obey Him. We have an expectation that God will ultimately bring a fresh move of His Spirit throughout the earth. This is to prepare us for the times that have been prophesied of in the Scriptures. The earth will be in turmoil in the last days. God wants us to be able to hold steady and understand how he works. He will care for those that have obeyed his voice. In Haggai chapter 2, verses 6 through 9, the Lord is speaking about a time of great shaking that shall come upon the nations of the earth. For thus says the Lord of hosts, Yet once more, in a little while, I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land, and I will shake all nations so that the treasures of all nations shall come in, and I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, declares the Lord of hosts. The latter glory of this house shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place, I will give peace, declares the Lord of hosts. Yes, 
There will be trouble in the days to come. However, God declares in this verse that his glory will be greater in the end time church than ever seen before. Then God says, in this place will I give peace. The peace of God is a most treasured gift. No man can produce true peace. It comes from him alone. Jesus is called the Prince of Peace. Psalm 37, verse 37 says, Mark the perfect man, and behold the upright, for the end of that man is peace. This is his promise to us, just as Jesus said in John 14, 27, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. The peace of God is not like the world's peace. It is not dependent on peaceful circumstances. Rather, it is given to keep our hearts and minds in quietness and assurance of God's wisdom and goodness, even in the midst of turmoil. This is his promise to us, that we do not need to be shaken by what is going on around us. The Lord is working to perfect us and develop in us his character. If we allow God to have his ways, wrought out in our lives, he will cause not only our hearts and minds here on earth, but our eternity to be full of his wonderful peace. Let us pray together for Zion Fellowship. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your ways. We thank you for the power of your word. And Lord, we look to you. We know that there's great turbulence ahead of us and our eyes are steadfast upon you. We don't look to this world for answers, but we look to you and we pray that you will meet with each one of your people in wonderful ways. Show forth your power and your glory through your church, we pray. Be glorified through us. We want to please you with our whole being. We ask these things and bless your people mightily in Jesus' name, amen. May the Lord keep his hand upon each one of you and cause his face to shine upon his people. God bless you. Your great love is all I desire To know you more is my deepest cry To be like you and to know your heart To serve you, Lord, I am set apart Those who are called For our God and King May we be called, chosen, and faithful And forevermore your praises will sing Your great love shows me to live, you forgave me, so that I forgive, you died for us, and then rose from the grave, our God and King, is strong and mighty to save, those who are called, chosen, and faithful, shall all stand before our God and King. May we be called, chosen, and faithful, and forevermore your praises will sing.
Shall all stand before our God?